Do you know what love is? Do you know what love is not? As we turn this morning to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, we have noted previously that there are seven different positives and seven different negatives in the middle paragraph that we call of this chapter, we call the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Here, here's a heads up. It helps when you're reading your Bible if you turn it around the right way. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7-ish, you find these 14 paintings or descriptions of love. Paul doesn't, through the Holy Spirit, he doesn't merely define love. He shows us, here, here's what love is, here's what love does, but then in counterpoint, here's what love isn't and what love doesn't do. We pick up this morning at verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 13. We will go ahead, though, and back up to verse 4 so that we don't lose too much of the train of thought. Paul writes, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. And then here we go. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. And we're going to stop there at that semicolon for our study today. Here, Paul presents to us in one verse, less than a sentence of material, he presents to us, them and now us this morning, three different Things, if you will, that love is not. Let's look at them each in turn, shall we? First of all, what does Paul say about love? Love is not. We're going to take the phrase that he uses, capsule it into one word. Love is not selfish. Love is not selfish. You've, I'm sure you've heard it before. We say it pretty often. It's worth repeating, though, that we tend to live in a, a culture, and it's not just our culture, really, it, it tends to be human cultures that are, that is me-centered, me-focused. What are those three best friends? Me, myself, right, and I. 1 Corinthians 13 reminds us that love is not that way. If we wanted to add to what Paul says or to put it in other words, we could say love is not selfish, but selfless. Love is not self-seeking, and that would be another way, by the way, to translate this phrase. It does not insist on its own way. You might even have a, an English version this morning that puts it that way. Instead of being self-seeking, driving and chasing after what's in it for me, Seeking, it has to be my way. I want it done this way because that's how I want it to be done. Instead, love is self-giving. Love is not about asserting myself and my preferences that are personal to me. Love is not about expressing my opinion and making sure people know where I stand and how I think this should be done. And by the way, it had better happen that way or else... Love is about giving oneself to God first and then giving myself to others. Love, at its very heart, at least this kind of love, divine love, biblical love, love that is like Jesus loves, at its very heart is sacrificial love. It's a love that costs. It's a love that gives at my expense to others. It's not about me. Love doesn't really know that word, me. Love knows you. 
This insistence on our own way sometimes comes from a couple of different places. And, and this is not an original thought with me. I stole this idea. I'm just passing it along to you. That sometimes in our minds, on the inside, this insistence that it has to be my way can come from a place of distrust. Where I don't trust you and your way. It's almost a perverted form of that saying, you know, that if it's going to be done right, what? I'd better do it. Sometimes we take that, and that's, that can be selfish, where I don't know that I trust you to do it the right way. Or if it's not done my way, and that's where the pride comes in too, right? It's the, I don't trust you, but of course I trust me. I don't trust your way, but my way clearly is the right way. You ever been there? It's easy to look at it from this way. It's easy to ask the question, have you ever been in a situation where somebody else was just, they were bound and determined, we would say, to have their way. And that's where we quote the old Burger King saying. But what if I read 1 Corinthians 13, 5 a bit more personally this morning? Have I ever done that? But let's say in, in something related to the church, an event that's happening or something that's happening in, in the way of worship or whatever it is, something that is merely a matter of, pr of preference or opinion. It might be something God's word doesn't directly address at all. He's left us liberty in that regard. But my word is a different story. Or in the home. I'm afraid sometimes, some of us husbands, we might read passages like Ephesians 5, and when we read that the husband is the head of the house, he is the leader of the home, that means I always get my way. But it doesn't just have to be the husband, it can be the wife. It can, it, there are some homes where the kids always get their way. If they want it, they get it. If they want to do it, they want to go to it, whatever, it might take some arguing. It might take some no's that aren't really no. Got to have their way. We could put it in this saying, my way or the highway. Have you ever celebrated that day? If you want to get out your calendar on your phone or if you like to write in your calendar, put down February 17th. 2022 that's the next day it's an annual celebration not a whole lot of people know about it but it's the my way it even rhymes day love never celebrates that day at any day of the year now, now I, I get there might be some innocence to it the idea is you it's a day where you get to do whatever you want to do it's kind of like an extra birthday all right you know if you want it you want to eat it you can eat it it's your cheat day, all of that. And there might be some, some innocent simplicity there, but it reminds me of what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 13, 5. That even as a culture, we have developed this mentality that you, you need to have your way. So much so, we'll give you a day. Now, I don't know how that works out when everybody gets their way on the same day. That might be tricky. When your boss wants you to show up at work and you say, no, it's my way day. I don't know how that works out sometimes. And that's part of the problem, right? Is if everybody gets their way, well, either nobody gets their way, or there's, and even regardless, in the process, there's a lot of fighting and conflict. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Turn back with me to chapter 10. Let's take note of a couple of examples outside of just this passage in this letter of this issue of selfishness. Did you know that Paul the Apostle was a people pleaser? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. After Paul has described the idea that he might be quoting them somewhat sarcastically where they've said, I can do anything I want. And Paul says, oh, okay, maybe you can as far as absolute law goes, but that doesn't mean that that's necessarily what is good. And so in verse 24 of 1 Corinthians 10, he says, Let no one seek 
his own good, but the good of his neighbor. And he goes on to give a specific example for their time of being careful about sensitivities. Now, our world right now has taken this to an extreme that Paul never intended, for sure. Where the, the idea of not offending someone, and it, it's like you get offended at everything, and we have to walk on eggshells, and you can't even, of course, you can't state God's truth, because that's always offensive to somebody. But look at how Paul sums it up, 31 through the end of the chapter. So, here, here's the high rule. Whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's chief. But then under that, it's like, as long as that's taken care of, as long as it's something that glorifies God, then he tacks this additional idea on. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks, to, to different cultures or ethnicities or backgrounds, or to the church of God. Makes it very careful here. It's God's people he's really concerned about. Be careful how you treat one another. And then he gives himself. He says, just as I try, watch it, to please everyone in everything I do. Now again, you could take that out of context and just say Paul was a people pleaser and you might go any different direction with it. But in this context, he's saying I'm glorifying God and then I'm, I'm careful. Paul didn't take this to extremes. This wasn't what his whole motto was. But he was careful that when it was possible, he didn't want to displease people. He wanted to encourage people. He didn't want to offend people. He wanted to build them up. And then he says, not seeking my own advantage. So read it again in your head. Love does not insist on its own way. Paul says, be careful you're not seeking your own good to the disadvantage of your neighbor. Paul says, I'm not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Now that last phrase is a pretty important contextual clue as to what Paul really focused on. What we should focus on as we strive not to be selfish and self center to be god centered his glory and then if you had to follow up to that because of that and focused on other people another example would be first corinthians chapter 14 let's read one verse from this passage and then we'll move on first corinthians 14 it's right after this chapter on love Paul goes back to his topic of spiritual gifts, these miraculous abilities the first century church, some of them were blessed with and given. And they'd been fighting about them and trying to rank them and therefore rank themselves. They were trying to build this hierarchy within the church. And so Paul says this. He tells them to be careful what they pursue in these gifts. Pursue love, verse 1 says. But then he said this in verse 4. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, there, there's a bit of a break here because we don't have these miraculous gifts like they did. But just take it this way. What about the gifts we still have? The abilities that we still possess? Let, let's say to use in worship or to use in some form of service. Is it ever possible that I use my gifts so that I feel better about myself? Or, or so that other people think better about me? Is it possible in 1 Corinthians 14 to take a gift that has a spiritual connection and take it from being spiritual to being selfish in use. Love, not selfish, but selfless. Here's the next one. Love, Paul says, and we'll take this one directly from the text, is not irritable. You might have the word easily provoked or easily irritated. 
And some have taken that word easily and have really focused in on that. But the word easily is not in the text. It's an over-translation. Paul just says, is not provoked, is not irritable, is not touchy. That'd be a really modern way to say it, really easy way to get it in our minds. So just make it a question. Are you touchy? There are some people that are, their fuse, what do we say, is really short. It doesn't take much to set them off, to annoy them, to irritate them, even to make them angry and really upset. And then most of the time, those personalities, they're over it. A couple minutes, a couple hours, a day maybe, and then the next day, it's like nothing happened. And there was no reconciliation or forgiveness, or it just, they're over it. Other people, they have a pretty long fuse, and it takes a lot, and it might even be burning on the inside, but they don't let you know. But then once that, once all that fills up, and they've had enough, and they say things like, enough is enough, they, might have, they may not have this big outburst, they might, but either way, when they get angry, when they get irritated, you know it, and they keep letting you know it, and it takes quite a while for them to naturally cool down. Aren't you thankful that the Bible says God is neither of those? That he is not quick to anger, but he's also quick to forgive. His anger does not abide forever, we're told, on multiple occasions. That's because God is love. The divine way to control our anger, our, our irritation, our annoyances, is love. And the world gets this. The world at least understands there's a problem with anger in our world. Why do do we have things like anger, what, management classes? That some people are even required to attend by the government? What about this one? I think I kind of got things backwards here, but what about pet peeves? This is a bit of a play on words. But 1 Corinthians 13, 5 is not irritable. It could also read, is not peeved. When I, when, I, when I think of that word, I think about pet peeves. And, and then I'm, I'm wondering, do I ever use that or something like that as a justification for my unloving irritation? I'm not saying that to be trite. But we have these pet things that, well, you know, this is something that gets me. That's a pet peeve of mine. So it's like, it's okay if I, if I get upset about that. It's okay if I get outraged because this is something close to my heart or this is something that really bothers me. What is that? Take a look at Proverbs chapter 14, verse 17. I might flip over there from 1 Corinthians In Proverbs 14, verse 17, we get this short two-phrase bit of wisdom as we find that pattern throughout most of the Proverbs. Proverbs 14, verse 17, he says this, the man of wisdom, a man of quick temper, acts foolishly. Pretty simple, isn't it? But not only note the way that he talks about it, but then look at how he compares or puts it with this. The rest of the verse, the second phrase is, and a man of evil devices is hated. Solomon puts those two back to back. I'm not saying that Solomon is saying those are the exact same or anything like that, but Would we put those in the same boat? A man, a person of evil devices. I mean, that sounds really bad. That that, that sounds like somebody like Hitler or something. I mean, that's just bad. And the back-to-back there is somebody that has a, a quick temper. 
but doesn't have temper. They're not tempered. They're, they fly off the handle at the least little thing. They're a person that can be provoked to anger. What about our phones or any device? Could it be that high-speed data moving, especially from dial-up and social media fuels? I'm not blaming that. The problem is really in our, is our hearts. But I, I, want, I wonder if that fuels some of this selfishness and this irritation this, the, the impatience, we get so irritated and frustrated in life and so easily disappointed because we're so used to everything instant. And if you've got to wait or you've got to listen to somebody talk about something that you're not real hyped on or, or someone complaining or someone chewing you out or someone that just uses that wrong tone, because everything happens virtually instantly now on our devices. And if I don't like something somebody's saying, I just keep scrolling. I don't even have to stop to read it anyway. And that works a bit different in person. I mean, you can walk out of the room or you can say, talk to the hand or something, but it's different. And, and then here's a good example. Good, it's bad too, because it hurts. How about restaurant staff? And this is the time when practically it's probably not a good idea, regardless of love or anything else. I tell, I've told people before, even if you don't care about Jesus and love, at least if you're going to get upset or let them know you're upset, wait until after you get your food. You know what I mean? But for Christians... It shouldn't have to come down to not wanting someone to put something in your food. It should be, Jesus loves me. Me. And all of my idiosyncrasies and my sins, he loves me. Think about Jesus. Was Jesus ever irritated? He got angry. When people had hard hearts against God's word, when people rejected him because of what it meant for them, they were heaping destruction on their heads. He got upset about things that mattered like that. But when it came to personal injury and insult, when it came to him not getting his personal way, what does he do when they spit on him, when they lie about him on the stand, on the witness stand? They bring in all these false witnesses and they beat him and they make the mockery of mockeries of the Son of God. Yet he was like a lamb, silent before his shearers. And I do not think it was that he was just holding it all on the inside. We do that sometimes, don't we? You just don't let it out, at least not for a while. I don't think so. Love is not irritable. Love, what did we already read, is patient and kind. Here's one more to take with you this morning. Love is not resentful. This is how it could go, how these can be, could be connected. Often when we don't get our way, we don't just get our feelings hurt, we get upset. Either irritated, whatever word you want to put on it, mad, upset, angry. And then that anger, if we keep on with it, if we keep, it turns into resentment. Another way to put this in 1 Corinthians 13, 5 is adding up or keeping a record of wrongs. Somebody's done you wrong, you put it on their account, but it's in your head. It's like the old country store where you go in, you buy the, the groceries, 
and you put it on the charge account. Now, sometimes it's on, on the account that you, you don't have any money, but that's what they used to do, right? There's still a few places, even in small towns like Elk City, where you can have a, a charge account. Love doesn't do that. When you treat me the wrong way, love, love doesn't make a list. doesn't keep a list of that. It's like the lady that's sitting in a marriage counseling session. And she told the counselor, she said, as they were expressing their issues, she says, but wait, let me tell you about what he did on our honeymoon. And it was only 21 years ago. Remember what you did? And then we start telling them. Or we'll say to somebody, you always do that. And then he might say, and then there was that time, and then we start listing. And this never happens between spouses. It never happens between church members or members and elders or deacons or preachers. We keep this little list. A great text to compare here is where Paul teaches us in Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 19, to be careful not to go around reciprocating in life where what you do to me, I'm going to do back something the same or worse. What does he say? Don't return evil for evil. But when somebody gives you something terrible, you give back love. But we do that. It's like a baby that we hold in our arms and caress. And nurse that grudge. And it tastes so good to just breathe it in. But it's like the person said that that feast where you lip your lips and, and it, you just you can't wait to get back and you keep holding on. And this bitterness develops in your heart and you get sour and you get hateful and mean spirited. And you wake up one day and realize that the feast you're eating is a skeleton. It's not pretty. Because all you're consuming is yourself. I saw a video the other day from what might be considered an unlikely source. And no, I am not giving any kind of recommendation, condemnate, com commendation, or anything to Kevin Hart. But there's this little clip where he's talking about this. And he says it this way. Here's a, a, a commentary from somebody that you would consider to be the last place to say something like 1 Corinthians 13 maybe. But he said, it takes too much time and too much energy to hold a grudge and be resentful. So ask it this way. In 1 Corinthians 13, when I consider love today, am I going about my life keeping a record of kindness? If you want to put down something, if you want to make a note of something mentally or actually, put down what somebody did that was kind toward you. Or am I going around trying to keep score like it's a ball game where you scored and now it's my turn. And we love competition. So you put competition and resentment together and you got a wonderful mix, right? No, Paul says love. Love is not resentful. Are you a Christian today? Do you know what love is? Do you know what love isn't? Today is your day. Today is your day, if you're not a Christian, to be buried with Jesus. And be resurrected to a brand new life. What is it Rod said in class this morning? 
about a new life. And as a Christian, a wearer and bearer of the name of Jesus, the Christ, do we love like this? Dave Simmons writes in his book, Dad, the Coach of the Home, or alternate title, The Shepherd. I kind of like that one better, of the home. He, He writes about a time, and this is a bit of a dated story, so bear with me, but he writes about a time he takes his two children, Helen that's eight and Brandon that's five, to the mall. A mall with a petting zoo. It's just a a place with a a fence around it, a small fence, barrier, a few inches of sawdust, and a ton of little furry critters they can pet to their heart's delight and feed while the parents shop. And so the kids are so excited when they see the sign as they walk in, and they say, Daddy, can we go to the petting zoo? And so Dad pulls out, if I can get it past my keys and my clicker, he pulls out two quarters, 50 cents. And he gives each of them a quarter, Helen and Brandon. They run off off with glee. He goes to Sears and is finding his way to a new saw in the hardware department. And he he catches Helen. She's right behind him. He, He thinks this can't be right. There's no way she preferred the hardware store to the petting zoo. She loves creatures more than anybody. and That's just her favorite thing to do. And so he says, sweetheart, what's wrong? She says, it actually costs 50 cents each. And so I, I gave my quarter to Brandon. He then writes, he says, do you know what I did next? It's probably not what you think. We went to the petting zoo And he says, I had another two more quarters burning in my pocket, but I never offered them, and she never asked. And she stood there with her hand and her chins on the small fence, watching her brother's delight. And she told him this. It's their family motto, their home motto. Love is action. Then he adds, she didn't. She said that. But what she lived, what she had seen and heard, was the rest of the motto is love is sacrificial action. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice of love. Let's stand and sing, stand and sing together.